you. Um, welcome everyone. Thank you all for attending what we believe to be a really exciting evening hosted by St Bride as part of the celebrations of their 125th anniversary. Well, this event is part of a University of Reading Leverhulme funded research project called Women in Type. Now, for the first part of the evening, we're extremely delighted to welcome three speakers, Martha Scottford, Ratna Ramanathan and Briar Levitt, all of whom have in different ways inspired, informed and therefore contributed to the research project. And I should add that this evening is also a celebration of the publication of this book, Baseline Shift, Untold Stories of Women in Graphic Design History, edited by Briar Levitt, and you'll hear more about this later. So our guest speaker talks will be followed by a Q&A session moderated by Alice Savoie. And the second part of the evening will provide you with an overview of our Women in Type research project, some of its published findings, and our new Women in Type website. Um, <laughs> I'd like to say, please bear in mind that tonight is the launch of this website, which we are still working on, and we will be continuing to develop, to develop as we update our findings. And this evening's event will close with a final Q&A session. So I shall now hand proceedings over to Becky Chilcott, who as curator of events at St. Bride will be our host this evening. Many thanks. Thanks so much, Fiona. Um, I'm just checking I'm off beat and you can all hear me, so I think we're good. So um, as Fiona said, I'm Becky and we're really delighted to be welcoming you here to one of our online St Bride Library events. Um, we're hosting this talk to raise money for the St Bride Library and all proceeds from ticket sales will go directly to keep it running for future generations to enjoy. And we really appreciate you for coming along and supporting us in this way. I just want to let you all know that we are recording tonight's lecture and this will be available for all attendees to watch after the event. So we'll be emailing you around a link, um, like maybe early next week at the latest. So if you do want to watch it again, you're very welcome to. Um, please do bear with us if we have any technical difficulties with the lecture. These things do happen as you know with online things. So if that does happen, please bear with us if there's a problem and you'll probably just have to re-log in with the Zoom link. Um, and if it all goes completely wrong, we will just have to reschedule the event, but I'm sure that will not happen. But I just want to let you know that it, that it, that it may be happening at some point, but fingers crossed it won't. So um, if any of you guys are having problems with Zoom your end, we have figured the best way of getting around this is to literally log out of Zoom again and get logged back in again or restarting your computer if that happens. But if for any reason you can't watch the lecture tonight or your internet connection goes, please don't worry, you will get the recording of the lecture so you won't miss out. So um, I just wanted to let you know about that. Um, can I please all make sure that you meet yourselves? Um, this should have happened already, but please do so that we don't interrupt any of the proceedings this evening. Um, if you do want to chat or ask any questions or have any queries or things you just want to share, then please do just put them in the chat box and we'll um, be asking you to put your questions in there as well. So please do just use the chat like that and we can sift through everything and make sure that we get everything, you know, make sure we come across everything. So do use the chat box and say hello to each other and things. So that's great. So I'd just like to let you know that this talk is part of our celebrating 125 years of the St. Bride Library Lecture Series and has kindly been sponsored by Adobe, Commercial Type, Eric de Belague, iMagazine, Google, Jerry Wright, Just Another Foundry, Klim Type Foundry, Lex and GB Creative and Innovative Print, The Mayor of London, Meteo Mediato Graphics and Animation, Peter Longland, Art Typography, Trevor Fenwick, Type By, Usborne Publishing, and the Wink and the Word Charitable Trust, who have sponsored students and recent graduates to attend this lecture. And just to let you know, we have two really fantastic lectures coming up over the next month. The first is the 50th anniversary of the Beatrice Ward Memorial Lecture, which is being held next Thursday. We have a range of international speakers talking on the theme of good type, bad type. And I'll put a link to this in the chat. So if you'd like to find out more or book tickets, you can find out more information there. We think it's gonna be an absolutely fantastic evening, evening and it's going to be held in person and online. So um, whichever you're comfortable with, we'd love you for, for you to attend. And if it, it, for people coming in person, it will be socially distanced. So please don't worry, we'll have a, you know, special COVID measures in place so that you know we're making it as safe as possible for everyone who is attending. 
Um, and then our final event of the year isn't up on our website yet, but I um, just wanted to let you know the date of the next I Magazine Type Tuesday, which is happening in December. And actually it's going to be um, disguised as a Type Thursday because of um, various reasons. So if you do want to come along to that, they're always absolutely fantastic events. And we, will, we do hope that that will be in person and online as well. And um, it's going to be on the 7th of December. So do watch out for um, information coming up about that on our social media channels as well. So it's going to promise to be another fantastic event. And it's all hosted by iMagazine with proceeds going to the St. Bride Library as well. So I am now delighted to introduce our first speaker, Martha Scottford, who has prepared a video for us to watch this evening. Martha is Professor Emerita of Graphic Design at the College of Design, North Carolina State University, where she's taught graphic design studio courses, typography and design history from 1890, 1981 to 2013. As a Fulbright lecturer in India in 2001, she also taught at four, four Indian design schools. She has also published articles in many prestigious design journals and magazines about women in design, avant-garde typography and design in India. So I'm just going to um, share, source out my screen sharing and then present her video and then we'll be over to Martha. So thank you for listening and I hope you have a great evening tonight. So just give me two seconds while I sort this out. Okay, so I've got the video up. So sort this out. Okay, here we go. Hello, and greetings from North Carolina. I'd like to thank Fiona and Alice for inviting me to share tales of my work. And thanks to Briar for involving me in her new book. I've chosen to discuss two major research projects that resulted in three different modes of distribution, a book, an exhibition, and a website. Let me share my screen. When I started teaching graphic design history in 1984, the Philip Meggs book was the only comprehensive text, but included few women designers. As an art history major, I had been following the feminist art historians through their groundbreaking reframing of the field. I read books like Anonymous Was a Woman, articles like Why Are There No Great Women Artists? I followed critics like the Guerrilla Girls, authors like Jermaine Greer and Sheila de Bretville. In response, my first research project was a quasi-scientific quantitative analysis of five graphic design history books, showing that by comparing numbers of and sizes of reproductions, graphic design history was visually and impactfully represented by 100% white males, and many were named William, Herbert, or Yosef. It was a story of single artist credits for public posters and ad campaigns and books. This led me to considering how many women in graphic design had been and were doing it differently and expanding the definition of designer from sole independent practitioner to all the roles that women have played in graphic design, including sole independent practitioner. They were and are partners, collaborators, teachers, writers, and studio employees. And mixing the professional with the personal, which is seldom mentioned for men, women have been diners, designer spouses and designer significant others, all of which resulted in my Messy History versus Neat History article published in 1994. To test this expanded framework, I needed a case study of a woman who was a prominent, award-winning, respected practitioner in her time who did not follow the male path, whose work and life were so good and so interesting that a deep dive would be rewarded. This led me to C.P. Pinellas. I was looking for a woman designer who was known, but whose range was not appreciated. Through an early graphic design history network in the US, I heard that the relatively new graphic design archives at Rochester Institute of Technology was the recent recipient of C.P. Pinellas' archives. I knew of her as an illustrator and an art director. She had started at Vogue and went on to Seventeen and Charm. I poked around enough to consider her a good prospect, but had little idea what the archive actually contained. 
For the earlier work and writing on women in design, I had received a National Endowment for the Arts grant and now received another for the Pinellas Project. I showed up in Rochester, New York in the summer of 1994 for a month of work. I decided I would have to let CP speak first. That is, what was in the archive and what could her materials tell me? It turned out she had a lot to say and more than fulfilled my hopes for a good case study. I was shown 70 bankers boxes of material, ranging from project files to personal diaries to an odd pair of shoes. There were sketches, dummies, letters, portfolios, teaching files, photographs, magazines, posters, and graphic ephemera she must have liked, all uncatalogued. There may be archivists among you who shudder at the thought of opening our access to such a trove before processing, letting loose an enthusiastic researcher into stuff whose real contents you, the archivist, have little knowledge of. I didn't know if this was good or bad for me, but I was ready. However daunting, it was really glorious to be the first explorer. I did have to figure out what to do and how to process it all how to make it retrievable for my project. This was my first archival work and I had no research methods training. It turns out I invented a finding guide. I looked through each box and made a new document for each that listed and briefly described the contents of each item in the order I found it. 70 boxes later, I had a thick notebook of the contents. And then I went back and started reading the materials and taking notes. More recently, I've read Anthony Caro's book about researching former President Lyndon Baines Johnson. In archives, Caro says, turn every page. I had done that. Later in the project, I would color code topics in my notes for reference. One aspect of investigating CP's personal life and its intersection with her professional one made research easier. She was married to two designers, William Golden, the designer of the CBS logo and corporate promotions, and Will Burton, an art director of Fortune and a, self and a science exhibition designer. Their families had also donated their materials to RIT, though these were not as voluminous as for CP. Now with a centered sense of her life and her life in design, I could expand my view in concentric circles and began talking with her family, close friends, former neighbors, and former students. I interviewed her colleagues and collaborators who were editors, artists, designers, photographers, and teachers. And I talked and wrote to members of the wider design community who had known her through committees and juries and conferences. I was, had beginning questions, puzzles to solve, relationships to define, and influences to track down. I spent months of two more summers in Rochester, but I also knew what I needed from other sources. The Freedom of Information Act provided immigration information. Pratt Institute had her student records. Parsons School of Design had faculty history. The Condé Nast archives included all her magazines. Lincoln Center for the Performing Arts had been a client. These queries were possible during the academic years while I was teaching. Little was online. I set up interviews, most were in New York, plus a stepdaughter in Toronto, and some had to be by phone, though I much preferred face-to-face -face when people would show me things and sometimes loan materials to photograph. The 50 plus interviews were recorded and transcribed and letter color, later color coded. One thing I learned about interviews, when your subject is well-loved and respected, people like to remember and talk about her. It was five years from the beginning of my RIT research to published book by Norton. Along the way, it was hard for me to say I was writing a book. That sounded so ambitious. Instead, I fooled no one by saying I was writing articles and that when stacked might well resemble a book. At a conference, I met an editor from Norton and once I started writing was able to provide an outline and some chapters to get a contract. There was a small advance that I knew I would need for picture permissions, which I had to do myself. These permissions were relatively easy. I had the RIT archives, CP's generous family and friends, and some eager former students. Even Condé Nast agreed to a reduced, reduced rate 
when I made the case for the student reading audience. Because I had been and still consider myself a book designer and remembered what I had thought about interfering authors, I could not fathom working with a designer from the other side as an author. So I convinced Norton to let me design the book as well. I fully enjoyed being back in this role, considering how to reference CP's design choices and getting the many images just where they belonged in the text. Using the wealth of photos and CP's artwork to tell her story to the fullest, I had decided to ignore the publisher's limits on images and color pages, which turned out to be fine. In the end, I was pleased with the printed book and it has sold steadily even 20 years later. There's, there was not much marketing for my book because the publisher was starting a design list and wanted to make the push after a second book, which did not materialize. Still, the royalties buy me lunch on occasion. A tip for writing a book. Set yourself up for a treat when you finish the manuscript. When I was about nine months from finishing, I signed up for a summer trip to India with a colleague. That carrot really helped me stay on track. Now to shift to my second project. Focusing on a male book designer, Ernst Reichel. About 10 years after the book, I was reading a wonderful memoir by Ruth Reichel, the restaurant critic for the New York Times and editor of Gourmet, when she mentioned her father had been a book designer. When a light goes off now, you can Google, and I was right about his work, that I remembered and liked it. I found too that his archives were at the Columbia University Rare Books and Manuscript Library in New York, and they had a finding guide. A visit to New York in 2009 included a visit to Columbia, where I had already arranged to look at several books, portfolios, and files related to Reichel. They had to come from remote storage in New Jersey. This library and archives were tightly organized and run with a reading room, procedures for requesting materials, and rules for using them. Permission card required, laptops, yes, only pencils, photos, okay. The portfolios and scrapbooks gave me a sense of the breadth of his practice as a book designer, a freelance designer of other materials, and a professional in the field. The archives had his copies of almost all the books he had designed. Reichel designed books for many publishing houses. Some books were famous for their content and or for their author. Ulysses has its own literary and legal history. Some authors were prolific and Reichel developed a brand for their books. He enjoyed the whole process of bookmaking. He was involved in the editing, production and marketing of many of the books. Since he worked for several publishers, he had a sense of their house styles. Reichel was of the book design school that believed each book's reading experience should be enhanced but not overtaken by design, though he acknowledged when he went overboard. He chose typefaces that expressed the time period of the content. He played with small design elements like the chapter numbers running up a side margin as an elevator story progressed, or other progressive elements that emphasized the sequential nature of the book. He made the most of his opportunities to design the full book package, jacket, cover and binding, along with the interior typography and layout. The major discovery with Reich, was Reichel's unusual practice. He had slipped into most of his book copies an index card where he recorded such things as production facts and problems, choices of typefaces, technical type issues, skirmishes with editors, interactions with illustrators and photographers. He often included why he had made certain design choices, what had influenced his design, how the book had sold, what he thought of the final product and who had helped him, often naming and praising his female assistants, who included his daughter. About the results, he was sometimes amused. Other times he comes off as a bit peeved or resigned, but mostly pleased. These cards are a gold mine, and I know of no other book designer who has left such an extensive and personal record about his design process. Early on, I realized there was no alternative to transcribing all the cards in full to preserve and to organize. 
They were written in pencil and pen with a European influenced handwriting and often used abbreviations. I discovered that given how they were written, it was a boon that I was a book designer too before desktop publishing and had learned to write type specs for typesetters. I could see these cards were the core of whatever I was going to do with Reichel. Here was a project I thought valuable and worthwhile. I made this case to the librarians who told me about the Columbia Library Research Grant, which I applied for and received, as well as a Bibliographical Society of America grant also received. These small funds paid for travel expenses and I have family in New York. Also, I know I was fortunate to have a job with summer vacations and a salary that supplemented any grants I received in order to pursue the work that interested me. After exploring Reichel materials and learning more about his life from his daughter and so other sources, I realized that the best way to expose his work to the public would be an exhibition organized around the books that had most animated him in his cards. The head librarians agreed. I would write the explanatory texts and design and install the exhibition in their gallery, a very traditional one with 11 large wall cases and four standing vitrines. Again, I was working at a distance. For research, I had to be in New York to read the cards and start photographing the books for reference. In between visits during vacations, I used my own university library's collection an interlibrary loan to get Reichel books to study and photograph. Here is the exhibit. Books become rather inert, inert blocks when exhibited, especially when behind glass. The challenge was to bring them to life with his comments, which would focus the viewer's attention on details and teach something about type and book design and production. For the large organizing elements, I wanted to reference Reichel in the design, so we used Palatino, a favorite of his, for text, and created a visual identity by combining his hand-lettered name from a portfolio cover with a colorful transition bar of several of his book covers. By this time, I had a graduate student assistant, Kezra Cornell, helping me. The exhibit was organized around themes revealed by the cards such as working with authors, book design concepts, title pages, covers, jackets, and bindings, production challenges. Each case theme was illustrated by a selection of his books open to the best example related to his comments. As you might imagine, this was frustrating because I was limited to one spread or one cover for each book. Though for Ulysses, his best known book, we had several copies to show the famous enlarged initials on title page and later pages. The cases and spaces had to be mapped and with the librarians decisions made about how the books were to be displayed and how many were reasonable for each case and its hardware. The actual installation was done by the two librarians and me, but long before that week, lists of books were provided. All the materials had to be called up from their various storage locations on site and New Jersey again, and the materials checked for condition and possible treatment. Books are reasonably permanent records of one's labor, but exhibitions are short-lived. The Reichel exhibit was up for three months in 2013 in a gallery that while open to the public is in the middle of a private university. The audience was always going to be small and self-selected. The show did receive a well-timed mention in, in the New York Times. I gave a gallery talk to a small audience that included his daughter and family and members of various design and printing groups. But how else could his work, and my work for that matter, find a larger and more durable audience? That brings us to the website. The Columbia Rare Books Library has a website and routinely reports on the exhibits in the gallery with a few photos and some text. That would do nothing for my work on Reichel. What his legacy required was a searchable website by author, title, and our themes to show multiple pages of the books and all connected to his comments, to share the information I had gathered and to save it for the future. My graduate assistant agreed to continue with the website. From her, I knew what questions to ask and it turned out the library site would not work for our purposes. We would have to build our own. 
From the exhibition, we picked up the graphic elements and the thematic organization and texts. Next was to devise the navigation and design the new pages using as much of the exhibition typography as possible. We could request library photographs of the books and selected pages, but the process was cumbersome and slow. We ended up using mostly the cleaned up reference photos I had been taking under poor light in the archives reading room. The website went live about two years after the exhibition closed. I paid for the grad student's time and that of a student programmer who helped her, the domain name and the hosting, and I continue to pay for name and hosting. It is linked to the Columbia site, but so far I have not convinced them to take over those responsibilities, and the future is unclear. Looking back over the notes while collaborating on the website, the frequent reviews, tinkering with texts and links and photos, I think it was much harder to do than designing the book. The grad student and I worked well together throughout, but here I wasn't in direct control of the production and there was so much time spent in communications. Also, I didn't have experience with most of the technical issues involved. However, it solved the problem of distribution of Reichel's efforts and mine as well. What are my takeaways from these projects that might be useful to you? Only subjects that truly interest you will provide the motivation to see a project through to a good finish. When using archives, get to know the librarians, the treasure keepers, follow all their rules, however annoying. Involve them in your research so they can more actively help you. In any project, maintain good relations and communication with all possible players. You never know when you might need their help and take photos of everything because you never know. Thank you all for your interest in type and publishing and women's history and keep up your good work. Thank you. Thank you so much to Mark for delivering such a fantastic um, talk. Um, sorry, getting my words in order then. Um, it's absolutely brilliant. If you do have any questions for Martha, she will be in the Q&A halfway through the talk, so do pop them in the chat. Um, now we're handing over to Briar Levitt, who um, is an Associate Professor of Graphic Design at the Portland State University. She spent her early career in publishing as Art Director of Bitch Feminist Response to Pop Culture magazine, as well, in a, as, well as being an independent book designer. Her feature length documentary, Graphic Means, a history of graphic design production, which follows design production from manual to digital methods, established her obsession with design history. She currently collaborates on the People's Graphic Design Archive and has just published a book of essays entitled Baseline Shift, Previously Untold Stories of Women Throughout Graphic Design History, which she's here to talk more about today. So I'm just going to hand over to Briar. So thank you. Um, I'm just going to spotlight you, All Briar. Right. Thanks, Becky, and thanks, Martha, that, that learned a lot from your talk. <laughs> still, still learning. I think so many of us historians are, you know, we weren't taught um, primarily as historians. So um, starting as a practitioner and becoming a historian means that we have to learn as we go. And um, so I got a lot of helpful tips. Um, okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. Can we see? All right, so um, yes, I'm Briar Levitt. I'm a graphic designer. I'm an associate professor and I'm a design history researcher. The book I edited, Baseline Shift, Untold Stories of Women in Graphic Design History, was officially released a couple weeks ago. It has 15 essays by 19 scholars, three of whom are speaking tonight, and others um, are in the audience here, which is wonderful. And it tells the stories of women in design history that haven't been shared widely. Um, in creating Baseline Shift, I think of myself as a producer. I originated the concept for the book and wrote the introduction and an essay, but the book wouldn't exist without the research and words of the authors who are included. Um, and you can see some, the names of the folks who wrote for the book here. I wanted to cover critical histories that hadn't been repeatedly published. 
And while I wanted to include images, it was the context of the history that was most important to me. I knew many people were doing original research about women in design, and this seemed like the perfect way to allow each unique story to have its own expert rather than generalized biographies of known practitioners by one author, which um, incidentally is something that was pitched um, as a possible book for um, me and a colleague to work on. And th these are kind of happening all over the place in publishing. Um, but I, I thought, no, let's, let's see what everyone else, there's so much research happening. Let's look at the original research that's happening. So broadly speaking, the book is building on the work of many, uh, of the work that many women have already done, but specifically the editorial approach is based on Martha Scottford's concept of messy history. She wrote that neat history is conventional history, a focus on the mainstream activities and works, work of individual, usually male designers. Messy history seeks to discover, study, and include the variety of alternative approaches and activities that are often a part of women designers' professional lives. So with this in mind, the book includes essays on um, women known but rarely discussed or given their due, like this one by North Carolina-based North Carolina professor Tashika Arsenault Sutton about um, a designer, Louise E. Jefferson. Well, she was a designer, an illustrator, um, a map maker, a photographer. Um, she got her start in the Harlem Renaissance and continued for decades, um, as well as essays about anonymous technicians in our industry who work to secure equity and inclusion in the typesetting trade by Sweden-based design collective MMS. There are pieces about overt feminists like this one by Tokyo-based Ian Lynham, which looks at feminist publishing in Japan during the 1970s. And there are ones that cover the marginalized women of spheres that we know well, like this piece by Berlin-based Madeline Morley about the one woman who is known to come out of the Bauhaus and practice advertising design, sorry, poppets. Not to say there, there aren't others, but so far. My own essay starting point was this book, which sat prominently facing out on my living room shelf. I would picked it up from a thrift shop, which is a common place that I interact with graphic design history. I'd never bothered to look at the name of the designer until one of these Twitter challenges where people were posting their favorite book covers. And it turns out it was the work of illustrator, designer, and author Ellen Raskin. I was surprised and delighted to see a woman's name on a mid-century piece I was so in love with. And of course, I knew women were, were working um, at this time, but I also knew that they were relegated to certain spaces a lot of the time. I didn't know a lot of women's names. I did know C.P. Pinellas, thanks to the work of Mar Martha Scottford. Um, but this was exciting to me. So here are two books with an oddly similar composition that were made 20 years apart. Raskin designed both covers and also wrote um, and designed the full book on the right. You may recognize The Westing Game. It was and still is a beloved young adult mystery featuring a spunky heroine, a murder, a will, and a kooky group of suspects. Um, and many people think it um, informed the cult classic film Knives Out. Um, and for those who are invested, I've seen that HBO is working on a series adaptation of this, of Raskin's novel. Um, but back to the story, um, I was interested in exploring her design and illustration journey from the first book to the other. Because she was a Newbery award-winning author for the Westing Game, which in the United States is for the quote, most distinguished contribution to literature for children, her papers and visual work have been archived at two institutions. Um, both are um, in children's book um, uh, archives, um, which is kind of interesting to think about um, and, and when you think about how some materials are gonna be in places you don't necessarily expect to find them. Um, I happened to be taking a cross country road trip from Virginia and um, in 2019 and made a detour to her papers at the University of Michigan Children's Research Collections. 
The second archive of her work is held at the Cooperative Children's Book Center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and while I wasn't able to visit that, um, that archive, I worked remotely with the incredibly helpful librarians. I mean, as Martha was saying, um, you know, working closely is really important. And um, through this archive, I was able to watch videos of Raskin speaking and being interviewed that weren't free, freely available elsewhere. And people were, were going in during the pandemic and making digital recordings for me, which is, you know, it's pretty incredible um, what we can get access to now. <clears throat> Raskin was trained as a fine artist at the University of Wisconsin, Wisconsin graduating in 1949. And after three years, um, in New York City, uh, working as an artist, she just felt like she couldn't make a job, uh, make a living that way. So she got a job in an ad agency where she started learning the production processes that are necessary in commercial art. And um, she sort of moved to some bigger ad agencies as she continued to learn specifying type and how to create paste up mechanicals. Um, and she was really just doing production work for other designers. Um, and she was only able to do her own creative work at home. She bought herself a little press where she could make prints and practice with type. type. And, and that's really how she, I mean, I think she was trained how to specify type, but she actually had her hands on type at home with her little press. Um, and it's interesting to note, coming from a printmaking background, it's not surprising that you can see in these little promotional calendar that she made that she was making her own uh, letter forms um, in addition to using existing uh, metal type. From her first early promotional piece, Raskin won multiple freelance projects, and she claimed she always had work from then on. Um, Book covers were her bread and butter in the late 1950s and 1960s. And she said that she designed over 1,000 covers in her career. And I haven't been able to confirm this, but she talked about it repeatedly. And um, I continue to find more and more. Um, and the way publishing works, um, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised. So this is her first uh, book cover that she, uh, that she made. She worked a lot um, with her, making her own letter forms and then working with a woodblock, um, wo uh, woodblock illustration. Sometimes I think she, she would fake it if she had less time and sometimes she would actually make, you know, do a carving or a lino cut. Um, <clears throat> perhaps the most famous book she designed uh, is the first edition of A Wrinkle in Time by Madeline Lingle in 1962. The type is clean and modern and it pairs with a geometric composition um, visualizing the children traveling by Tesseract. And she also designed Lingle's uh, 1965 mystery thriller, Arm of the Starfish, which uh, was a particular favorite of mine as a tween. If you have a tween, they should read this book. <laughs> um, kind of a dark, she, she shows it, it's, it's a darker one. Um, here's an example of one of her paste up mechanicals from 1965 that shows a more straight ahead use of serif typography paired with her woodcut style illustrations. Um, and here's a detail of the board that shows her signature with the illustration, corrections to the line work, instructions to the strippers, and of course, pasted uh, typography. And then here is the final jacket. So she really was flexible in how she was utilizing typography. There wasn't one approach every time. Much of her jacket typography worked to support her dynamic illustrations, although she did create conceptual type treatments as well. This book is a collection of letters written by a Catholic and mystic artist, Carol Hauslander, and the form behind the script creates an abstract cross. Raskin's most harmonious typography is often the lettering that she made herself. It just feels perfectly in tune and integrated with her illustrations and not surprisingly, because they're um, likely made with the same tool. This is, uh, she did a few record covers, um, 
most, I mean, her, her biggest output was book covers and then and later books, but there are a few uh, record covers. And here's a more sort of um, rough hewn uh, print of, and, and lettering that she did for cast and class in a Southern town. She was never tied to one style. While she certainly continue, continued to use techniques that worked for her, you know, she would repeat techniques that worked for her. She did allow herself to work in visual languages appropriate to her projects, the subjects, and her audience. Um, this flexibility allowed her to design for many book subjects, poetry, law, fiction, social sciences, mathematics, philosophy, and more. There was usually some kind of illustration, but as you can see in the top left, sometimes uh, the, the cover was completely typographic. And, you know, much, much of her typography was um, a sort of a simple or clean pairing with her illustration sort of to, to balance off the the dynamic illustrations, but she was clearly looking at the type and lettering trends of the day. And so you can see this very groovy flared lettering on um, the smile on the face of the lion here wrapped around the muzzle. Or here with this eclectic lockup of typefaces. And it's hard to tell, but um, right to the left, they're all there. Each one is numbered as if to denote the, the modes of thought referenced in the title. She really uh, became more and more of a fan of the sort of a collectic lockup of typefaces. This is another um, example of her lettering pairing really well with her illustration. And it's an unusual one for her in the sense that it's not her usual sort of um, woodcut style. So she, she has this illustration with the the ruled lines abstracted and the, um, the lettering is um, referencing that. And then of course, as someone who is very interested in production history, I, I like to show her production a lot. <laughs> um, so after designing and illustrating many books for other people, Raskin felt it was time to create her own book. And um, she had made picture books for other people, um, but um, her first book was Nothing Ever Happens on My Block. And, um, you know, clearly her time specifying type informed her work here. She's using six typefaces in, a, in the lockup for, you know, again, this is, this is a kid's book. So it's kind of a, an interesting, you know, less common um, approach for a kid's book. And she continued to write and illustrate. She loved wordplay and visual jokes. In the book Spectacles, the heroine needs glasses. And so she keeps seeing these fantastical things with her poor eyesight. And so she kicks off the book with the title treatment that the little girl can't, you know, can't quite see what, <laughs> what the lettering says until you turn the page. A favorite children's book of mine that she made was um, the illustration and design of books, a book to begin with. This is like a series of um, instructional books for kids. And um, it was just a perfect place for her woodcut style illustrations and bookish typography. And um, it just sort of goes through the story of the manuscript um, all the way to, you know, you know, books as we know them today. And um, she created almost all the illustrations. Um, and uh, it just, it's just a particularly charming one. Sometimes her lack of formal education in typography shows um, the type she created for the cover of A and B or William T.C. Baumgarten comes to town, for instance, looks a bit plain and awkward especially paired with her warm line illustrations. Um, and perhaps the title is just an unusual word grouping, but it's likely something that could have been resolved maybe with a different type treatment or maybe a different typeface, but her lettering inside saves the day. It's varied, it integrates with the illustrations. And as always, 
it shows a playfulness with the words themselves. So many of her stories um, are about a play on words. So you can see that all these signs are highlighting the A and the, um, and there's, you know, beautifully executed. But she was clearly looking at typographic trends as, she, you know, as I was talking about, even for the kids' books, we've got Bookman Swash for a paper zoo and this another eclectic lockup emulating a sort of Victorian circus style um, for um, the world's greatest freak show. Um, and, you know, this was a style that was popular in, this, in the 1960s and 70s. When her editor asked her what she would do for illustrations in her first young adult book, The Mysterious Disappearance of Leon, I mean Noel, Raskin panicked. She wanted readers to use their imagination and she was really starting to move into more of an author at this point. So her solution was to make what she called word pictures or illustrations using the lettering to reflect the characters' uh, personalities. So this is kind of like, you know, this is her halfway, you know, she's sort of balancing her two sides of herself. And um, her YA novel, Figs and Phantoms, ends up taking a more strictly typographic approach, which was utilized throughout the book for notes and other story details. Most of her, her young adult books have a mystery component. And again, lots of plays on words and silly uses of words. Um, so um, for this one, um, the, the bits of type fun function like typographic illustrations that she deliberately made to engage young readers in the text as much as possible, sort of broke up the body text. And she involved herself not just with the illustrative typography, but the body copy as well. She said, the printer's galleys come back and they have to be paged. I think I'm the only writer to fortunately have a publisher who allows this. I rewrite for the look of the page. I want my books to look readable. I know that some of the mysteries are complicated, but they are made less so by breaking up the page and by making it look fun to read and fun to hold. And, you know, it's important to remember that these lockups of typography were not something that could be thrown together and tested with the click of a button. Her roughs and tight sketches for, and, uh, you know, for the tight treatments of figs and phantoms show a kind of um, thought and planning that went into these typographic concepts well before the type was ordered, and trimmed and pasted down for the printer. Uh, and I was able to see a pretty full picture of her process for Figs and Phantoms in the archives. Um, so here we've got sketches. Um, <clears throat> and then there were some photocopies, which are often an, uh, used for looking at scale. Um, and then she's also got some notes and then to her paste up mechanical. So you can see sort of how she was actually building out the, the, the type that she got back from the typesetters. And then here it is in the book. And this is another simple one that I like because it's just this little bit of custom inking that brings in just a little bit of character. So for, for, you know, for a 12 year old, this just brings the story alive a little bit more without relying on illustration. And here, here it is in the book. <clears throat> like many women working outside the home during the women's liberation movement in the 1960s and 70s, Raskin wasn't particularly outspoken about the challenges of women in illustration and design fields, but her thoughts did creep out from time to time in interviews. In one, she said, my illustrations are very masculine, which is why I used to sign myself E. Raskin. When I was, when I was working for Young and Rubicam, the advertising agency, some of their clients wouldn't employ a woman. Easily enough, I became E. Raskin. No one knew any differently. This is one that I found where she just signed it Raskin. That's her first book. 
In a 1978 Q&A session, Raskin notes that she's a little ambivalent about taking questions as she had recently been asked by an audience member if she, is, if she was rich and if not, who cleaned her house and made her lunch during the day. Raskin replied that she made a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and that she and her husband, editor of the Scientific American, Dennis Flanagan, made the bed together. The, women scoff, the woman scoffed. Um, the audience she is relaying this to, which seems to be a chorus of adoring women, laugh in sympathy. So, you know, there's, there's you know, support and questioning happening simultaneously. And the challenges were sy systemic, of course, as well. Um, and, and those continue today. But what sociologist Arlie Hochschild uh, termed the second shift in her 1989 book of the same name is the expectation that women working outside the home will shoulder the same domestic burdens as those who don't, resulting in a never ending cycle of workshop, parent, work, repeat. So while it's not clear what her childcare situation was after she divorced from her first husband and her design career was taking off, she described her working day like this. I would come home, play with my daughter. After she was in bed, I would stay up and sit down at the drawing board or my printing press and stay there for six hours straight. When I was freelance, I would sit down at nine o'clock in the morning at the drawing board, not allow myself up until noon, have a half hour for lunch, half hour for shopping for dinner, sit down again until five, and then again from 7.30 until 10. So this was every day, including Saturday, and it's hard work. Despite the challenges she faced, Raskin carried on with her work successfully until her untimely death in 1984 at the age of 56 as a result of a connective tissue disorder. She lived in a, the tolerant New York City and had a supportive partner in her second husband. She was actively engaged in the publishing world through events and conferences, which certainly helped her as a woman working in what was still predominantly uh, a man's world of design. That said, she was awarded repeatedly for her work. There are 23 award certific or certificates in her papers at the Children's Literature Research Collections at University of Minnesota. So you can see one from, uh, there's, there are actually two from AIGA here. She's got a few from TDC. Um, so she did no success in her lifetime. The essay I wrote can be seen as a starting point for looking at Raskin's work um, from a design and typographic perspective. With over 1,000 book covers um, and, of course, a number of children's books, there's plenty more to uncover. To learn more about Raskin and about so many other women in graphic design history, check out Baseline Shift at papress.com. Thank you so much to the contributors who are here today. Thank you so much, Briar. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, again, if anyone has any questions for Briar, she will be joining us back in a minute. So do put them in the chat and um, we'll look forward to getting to those in a minute. I'm now delighted to introduce our next speaker, Ratna Ramanathan. Ratna is a typographer, researcher and educator known for her expertise in intercultural communication and alternative publishing practices. She is Dean of Academic Strategy at Central St. Martins, London. For the past 20 years, Ratna has headed research-led intercultural multi-platform graphic communication design projects, all fueled by a love for and lifelong interest in typography and language, and a belief that communication is a fundamental human right. So I'd now like to hand over to Ratna. So I will just um, spotlight you and then away we go. So sorry, I'll just find you where you are. There we go. So I think that should be good. Can you see my screen okay? Yep, all good. Brilliant, okay. Thank you everybody and thank you for the very generous um, introduction, Becky. Thank you to Fiona, Alison and Bryant for the opportunity to talk today about something that's really close to my heart but also for the invitation to talk about something that you don't normally get jobs to talk about, which is a different way of doing things and expanding our way of both thinking and making. So today my focus in expanding the design canon is on Tara Books, it's an independent feminist publisher based in Chennai, India. 
for those of you who are yet to come across that work, you might ask the question, why Tara Book? They were founded in 1994 by a collective of designers and writers who were committed to egalitarian principles. And from the start, they were interested in changing the perspective from which stories are told. So this meant expanding the notion of authorship, the notion of the book and its content, and the notion that the design played in the publishing process. The Tara books are the result of collaborations, often with unusual talent from unlikely places, as, as we'll see in this presentation. And their aim was to reflect the richness and breadth of perspectives that exist. Now, my design journey is formed in part by Tara because I've designed books for them, some of which you see on the screen at the moment, for many years. And the Tara approach made me curious about independent and alternative modes of publishing and design and led me to uh, pursue my PhD on this topic at the University of Reading. I learned to Tara that the making, designing and producing of a book is based on community. Publishing is a collaborative enterprise where the success of a book cannot be attributed to one individual. And therefore, it's always felt kind of odd to me to consider sole achievement as a part of the publishing process, because it's by very nature dialogic, collective, and heavily dependent on the work of others at every stage. Now, Tara saw India's rich and popular vernacular art traditions and that they were missing from books. So their mission really was to enter into uncharted territory, to reject misogynistic or casteist or racist content, and to challenge what was the Indian market of really dull, moralizing children's books that had become the norm. This is a picture of Tara team in their space. And this includes not just the writers or the designers or the publishers, but everyone who has a role in making the book come to life. And because they take a collective and equitable approach, everyone, no matter where they are in the process of making the book, has equal value and contribution. So the publisher and author are important, but they remain equal in contribution to those of others, such as the bookseller, the printer, the binder, the typographer, and so on. Now, this way of working is also reflected in their space. For 18 years, Tara worked in rented houses because they couldn't afford their own space. And when they did, they designed it around how they wished to work. So the book building, as it is called, is in Kupam Beach Road in Chennai, and you must visit. It's the headquarters of Tara since 2012. And the building, like the publishing company, works with free flowing spaces where people can meet, gather, collaborate, exhibit work, and make books. The building has a place to stay and studio spaces. It also has a communal kitchen. So it collectively aims to create a really inclusive atmosphere that's both social and productive. As you walk through the building, you're reminded of Tara's work on the pillars, in the courtyards, and in the facade. When you go across the space, there are little nooks uh, with books in them. And then there's a reading couch for kids. And this leads onto an exhibition space, which overflows into a courtyard. Now, the space is anchored by those who populate it, so it keeps changing. And it seems to say to us, what is a book or a publisher without a community of readers? Now, when I asked the publisher, Geeta Wolf, what she sees as publishing, she remarked that it was a conversation between the book and the reader, but importantly, bet between the people who make it design and produce it. So in her own words, she notes, at Tara Books, we think of the book as a moment in time, a picture of a much longer process. There is a story of how the book was made, and then you have the book itself. And once the book is published, you then have the entire story of how it is received and read, and what else happens as a result of that perception. So this is the conversation. In the case of I See a Promised Land, this is a conversation between cultures and a collaboration between two people from very different walks of life. It tells the story of Martin Luther King Jr.'s life through the patois art of the artist Manu Chitlakar and the words of writer and storyteller Arthur Flowers. Now, Guglielmo Rossi, who designed it, is in the audience today. This is the graphic novel that links the Bengali scroll art tradition with contemporary text. 
Martin Luther King, as you may know, dedicated most of his adult life to the idea that all people should be equal. So it's only fitting that a work about his life is multicultural. Another example is the London Jungle Book by the brilliant gold artist Bajju Chang. It's titled both as a homage and a mirror image counterpoint to Rudyard Kipling's The Jungle Book. It tells the story of Bajju's first journey out of India to London. And the book has a really important layer of historical significance. A century earlier, Bajju's tribe had been studied by a British anthropologist called Varia Elwyn. And he had married a Gond woman and written several books about the Gond tribe. Bajju's grandfather was Elwyn's servant. So he had grown up listening to the stories of Elwyn, but also of Kipling. The London Jungle Book was summarized by Bajju who said, Elwyn Sahib wrote about my tribe. Now it's my, it's my turn to write about his tribe. Sometimes the book is a conversation prompted to give voice to nature and animals. Tara aims to reverse the anthropological gaze through its engagement with folk and tribal art in its visual and handy books. Now, before climate change was a, tropi, uh, was a trendy subject of focus, Tara looked to tell stories of how we inhabit this earth together with humans and non-humans as an important way of asserting values to children through the form of the book. Another way of expanding the way that the book expands is ways of reading. In India, reading is a public and social activity. Benedict Anderson tells us that reading is a private activity that takes place in the layer of the skull, invisible from public scrutiny or intrusion. But this is not the case in India, where there was and still is a very sophisticated oral culture. Tara has explored this in a number of ways. They often ignore markets and classification. They use the book to tell important and difficult stories, such as The Boy Who Speaks the Numbers, which is set in Sri Lanka and told from the perspective of a very young boy. It's a satirical account of childhood in times of war. And the events it narrates could happen anywhere else in the world, in all places where human deaths are reduced to numbers and guns don't differentiate between adults or children. The other way of expanding reading is explored through typography. And whilst we all, we all acknowledge typography as a craft, it's equally interesting to think about it as a fundamental way to understand and engage with the world. Tara's approach in picture books challenges conventional separations of image and text and blurs the boundaries of what an image should do and what a text should do. So there's a place for typography to play, to rate across the page, to build narrative. The tiger on the tree gave me a chance to explore voice, tone, accent, and context, each designed to reflect the world around the book rather than just the thorough original text. Publishers like Tara Books also challenge publishing process by asking the designer to have a voice as that of an author. They were the first in India to acknowledge that design plays an important part in the publishing process. And I'm proud to be one of the first designer authors in India, thanks to Tara. Now book design can be a very strict and conventional process. It can be intuitive, experimental, warm and humorous as well. So one can enjoy the rich and varied elements of this process, depending on the context of the book and its intended audiences. So this book becomes a research space to understand the politics that surround typography and language. And by politics, I mean the power that aesthetics, that visual and the typographic carry as voice, but also as a language in itself. How can we use typography to include people rather than exclude them? And how can we give those without a voice a chance to have one? When I asked Geeta, she said, for us, design is not something that we use simply to make things look nicer. Design is integral to how meanings are and can be made. It is that thing that sometimes guides you quietly through the book, and sometimes it is more apparent. So the role of typography is that it can be loud, but it could not be, and that is a decision to be made. How can design be used not only to hold the book together, 
but to elevate it like a third voice. And sometimes this leads to giving a voice to others who haven't had the opportunity to have one. As Geetha notes, what invariably happens in traditional indigenous setups is the process of translation. The story in the book are translated into another language, and this language is not only in the sense of words. One of the things the visual has done for Tara is to transcend language in that very strict verbal sense. So Tara often works with people who are not literate in that strict sense. And the fact that they work with all of these people who can tell their stories visually means that you can cut across class, caste, and other divisions. Some of these voices, she says, don't get heard because of language. And some people don't engage with books because of language. So what we have done in focusing on visual as a language is to bring access into people's lives who don't speak or read or write the same language or who don't read or write at all. Now, this is the case with Sangeeta Jogi and her recent book, The Women, the Women I Could Be. Sangeeta lives with her extended family consisting of her husband, her children, her in-laws, her husband's brothers, their wives and their children. They're farm laborers and Sangeeta's life is no different from that of scores of young women in impoverished rural communities in India. Her husband's village in Rajasthan is a region that's known for strict patriarchy. Women are expected to be veiled in the presence of men, and they're very rarely active in any kind of public life. So despite this, Sangeeta has discovered an extraordinary creative outlet for herself, which is drawing. She explores in this book what it means to be a modern woman, who has the world open to her without guile, envy, or self-pity. She's aware of the treatment of women in the patriarchal society, and she negotiates her own course through it. Amita's own work is a living testimony to what women can achieve, but in her own life, there are still many things she wishes she has the power to change. And one of the first things she has changed is to bring her story to the powerful object that is the book. And so a book is challenging. What is convention? Who is an author? Who gets to be in a book? Whose story is told? And who gets to read this book? And sometimes this challenge is about the language the book is in. For Baju Sham, whose mother tongue is Hindi, he wrote a book that many in his community could not read or access because it was, it was published in English. So one of Tara's ways of providing access to these stories was to decolonize them, to return the knowledge contained within the book back to its original linguistic context. The challenge is also about how books are made. When I first met Tara, they were thinking of starting a silk screen printing unit to produce their books. In a Western context, this is completely mad. But in an Indian context, it makes perfect sense. It's economical. It provides a livelihood for all of the people that you see on my screen. And the materials used themselves are sustainable. So today, this has become a unique quality about Tara's books. From constraints was born creative thinking and then innovation, another important design lesson. Sometimes expanding the canon means questioning the roots of the canon itself. The roots of the Tara process really questions what many of us take to be a book in its content that we have spoken about, but also in its form. In the Indian context with palm leaf manuscripts, the codex is a colonial intervention. Returning to other cultural forms of the book is one of the approaches Tara has taken. On the left of the screen, you see Tsunami, a scroll by Patua artists who sing their narrative to a community and travel with the book. Tara uses the scroll as a graphic novel format. And they recognize that books have rhythm, but they also have space. And we very rarely explore the qualities of these when we design them. Now, coming back to expanding the canon, my journey with Tara over decades has caused me to question and challenge and revisit my own assumptions as an urban Indian about design, typography, and publishing. And I would like to end by sharing some of this learning with you. Firstly, as many of us in this audience have the privilege of knowing and experiencing, making at its best 
is a collaborative and not an individual conversation that brings diverse voices together. For me, a good book is one where you can't tell who has done what, and you simply enjoy it as a, as a product of the label as good reading. Secondly, I've learned not to stereotype or make presumptions about how people read. Context and culture are important deciding factors, and typography should serve all of these diverse readers. This is probably preaching to the converted, but if we see design as an authorial voice and integral to the process, then design is not decoration, but meaning making. And it comes at the start of a process to guide it rather than to finish it. Materiality is equally important as content in the making of, a, of meaning. Paper and printing, tactility, form of the book, these all add important aspects of meaning. We grow up with presumptions of who should read what, and this often limits our view of the world, I think. With my experience with Tara, I've learned there is no single audience or single reader, just a community of readers who enjoy books, and they, they exist across the ages. So for me, the book is a place of change. It reflects the world we want to be and live in, and we can change the world through the way we make reading unfold within the book. And finally, it should be more than about just the people who are in the room at the time. I think this is about bringing more people to the conversation, just as Fiona and Alice and Sam Bright have done today. And it's about building and expanding the canon, which also means a commitment to building and expanding a community. And I look forward to having these conversations with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ratna. That was absolutely fantastic. And I think now we're going to hand over to Alice, who is going to be um, moderating the Q&A next. So if anyone does have any questions they want to ask, please do pop them in the chat. So I'm now just going to um, just please bear with me while I just highlight the correct people for the Q&A. So um, there's one. Sorry, it will take me just a couple of seconds to sort this. Um, and just for Martha next. Um, where is she? There we go. Okay, great. Over to you, Alice. Great. Thank you, Becky. Uh, thank you, all the three of you for these uh, really inspiring lectures. That was that was great. Um, I, so we had a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, one, was for Martha um, from Stefan, who says uh, he's currently doing his own research on various unknown graphic designers from Canada as an independent researcher. And uh, I think his question is, uh, is going to interest quite a few people, uh, including me. Uh, he says, just when I think I can wrap things up and package my findings, more is found and I'm left untangling even more material. And he says, how does one know when to stop researching and to start publishing without the fear of missing or overlooking important artifacts or information? <laughs> um, well, as we know from lots of biographies of lots of people, there's always something new to find or a new way to look at something. So I guess um, I would say once you think you have enough to show what you want to say about your subject, um, start writing and get it out there. Um, you know, there, there will always be things afterwards and, and other people chiming in, but to, to publish a, something solid, even though it's not going to be full and perfect and complete um, is important. So just mm. do it. Yeah, that's also where what you were saying in your presentation about having a you know something to look forward to as well as a kind of an incentive to finish is probably also a good idea. Yes. Um, thank you, Martha. Um, there was a comment which I think it can also be meant as a question for Briar uh, from Elizabeth, who said uh, she suggested you might have enough material for a book on Ellen Raskin. Uh, is well, this something you're considering? It's funny because watching <clears throat> Martha's presentation tells me I have my I have a lot of work to do, <laughs> <laughs> but just no, you know I would need to spend much more time with her works, but I. 
you know, the, the lucky thing with Raskin is that she was an author and she was interviewed a lot. And so she talked about, she talked a lot about her writing mm-hmm. and there was some discussion about the design of her book. So I, I have that, I have some of that information, but I would need to go deeper, but there is enough. I think there's enough content, just more work for sure. I was actually wondering whether you were able to interview anyone who either worked with her or some of her family, friends. Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Do you think that might be something, uh, do you know of anyone who would be able to tell you a bit more about her? Yeah, I think in the, in the publishing world, it would be okay. definitely possible. Okay, so that might be a, a way of getting deeper into the subject. Yeah. Exciting. Um, and in relation to this, that was another question I had for Martha is uh, regarding Ernest uh, Ernst Reichel. I was wondering uh, whether you did consider at any point making a book about him. I mean, you said about the website and, and how it solved the issue of distribution, but were, were you tempted to also do a book about him or not? Um. I guess not, um, because I didn't think there was as much about him as a person that was available um, mm-hmm. as had been possible with CP. And um, I thought it was more about the work and um, his, his engagement, I thought was, was the better story and mm-hmm. therefore it needed another kind of distribution. Thank you. Um, I see that someone is asking if, uh, in relation to uh, what Ratna said about um, collaboration and the emphasis on collaboration in at Tara, um, uh, someone is asking if Briar, you could say something about the, the the question of collaboration in relation to Raskin's trajectory. Sure. Um, I mean, in the beginning, she was she was the designer putting this 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 as Ellen Lepton has said, the spit polish on the, the product of someone else, I guess, you know, like the classic graphic designer. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and later she was her, she really was designing for herself. I mean, she had an editor, but she was designing in sort of a classic, or she was writing and designing her books and illustrating her books kind of in a, in in an isolated way actually um i mean she had an editor and she worked with classic publishing um so i mean she certainly relied on people but i don't think she was a very collaborative type of practitioner um i think you know the book baseline shift itself is a big collaborative project and it's it it wasn't anything that could have happened without the work of other people. But yeah, I would say that Raskin herself was actually quite, you know, she worked like a freelance designer from home or from a studio and and not with other folks. Thank you. Um, I also had a question for Ratna. I really, really enjoyed the way you presented the work of Tara and, and the kind of um, lesson that you've um, uh, drawn from that. And I was wondering how your collaboration with them has influenced the way you interact with other clients or you know how it has maybe changed the way you you work when you when you design a book i think it's, i think it's two things that i learned and i think i got spoiled working working with them a little bit because i uh, one is research i think that there was something very much about uh it being a research based so it just the, the books take the time they need to take. Um, and so there isn't that sort of speed off something. So, you know, if it needs some more time to evolve, it needs some more time to evolve. Um, and that's quite a luxurious but important position, even though they, you know, they, they're still, they're really important. They really value the importance of, of, of that. Um, and also I think they changed my idea about how collaboration could happen. So I met them just as I was going, coming to London to my, do my master's at Tennessee Martins. And I just said, well, I'm, I'm leaving. And they were like, well, what's that got to do with anything? <laughs> and this was before the internet, you know, before all of that. They were like, well, you know, it's the community, it's the, really, you, you know, the com- community ebbs and, and flows. So, and then it influenced very much, you know, um, 
when I worked for Fiona and John on, on the multi-classical library and we were based in different, multiple parts of the world, it didn't phase us that much. Um, so I think, yeah, that there's an openness that who you work with doesn't have to necessarily be about national boundaries. Mm. Thank you. And I see that actually John Hudson has got a question. Hello, John. Um, he says to you, Ratna, he says, I'm struck by how much of Tara Book's output is in English compared to Tamil or other Indian languages. Yeah. How do the publishers see their role in this respect? Well, I think I was uh, I was slightly um, uh, picky about showing what I what I showed because I have to say that only recently the Tamil type has kind of entered into the market. So it, I think that that's evolved quite quite a bit. Um, so I've hidden some of it because I'm a little bit ashamed about the Tamil typography, uh, John. So. <laughs> Um, but I think that those books actually are coming out and they're, they're I would say they're printed slightly differently in a, a bit more economical way so that people can actually afford to buy them in the vernacular market. Mm -hmm. So there's different models there. There's the beautiful handmade one, which could, you know, cost uh, uh, the same as a hardback book, for example. And then you have a, a more economical one that's, that's available for, for popular press. Thank you. I think we'll, I will just take one last question and then I think we have to move on. But um, um, I think yeah, Fiona was asking you, Martha, what are your hopes for the, the future of the Rifle website? Ah, well, I'd like it to continue. Um, and I, you know, it's just one of those things that um, it doesn't cost that much money, but, you know, it, it keeps. <laughs> it requires that to keep on going. And so the idea of trying to get some, some institutional connection strikes me as a way to not worry about it, but you know, I have to poke them again. <laughs> mm, sure, okay. Uh, thank you. I, I see that, um, yeah, there are other questions and Fiona points out that some of these questions can be raised in the final Q&A because there are some really interesting ones there that we don't really have time to um, address now, but hopefully later at the, oh, end, at the end. Thank yeah. you so much. Alice. Thanks. Thanks to you three. Yeah, thank you very much. Right. Um, if you just bear with me while I um, remove all the spotlights. Um, and then I will introduce the second part of our evening. And, um, right. So um, next, I am delighted that we are introducing the launch of the research project, the Women in Type project, which was undertaken at the Department of Typography and Graphic Communication of the University of Reading between March 2018 and November 2021. The project is led by Fiona, Professor Fiona Ross with Principal Researcher Dr. Alice Savoy and Postdoctoral Assistant Dr. Helen, Helena Lecker. The website for created, created for this project was conceived by Alice Savoy and Matthew Trier as an accessible and interactive tool to share the project's findings with the wider public. And now I would like to hand over to Fiona who will tell us more about this. So over to you, Fiona. Thank you, I shall try and share my screen correctly. It's hopeless in our rehearsal yesterday. Is that all right? Absolutely perfect, thank you. Well, um, a huge thank you to the wonderful speakers who have made this evening so special already. So we would allow, now like to take you on an illustrated walk through the Women in Type project. So I will be describing the impetus behind the project and its origins, our aims and methods, Alice will take you on a whistle-stop tour of some of our research findings that have resulted in different kinds of outputs. And then Mathieu will introduce the new website being launched this evening, which he has created for us and which we really conceive of as being a virtual exhibition. This comes as our project officially draws to a close, but which we shall continue to develop in the future. Now the project started officially in spring 2018, but our interest in this topic clearly stems from our previous research and work experiences, and therefore also the knowledge that print and design histories have tended to overlook the considerable activities of those in type drawing offices, particularly those of women who contributed to type making during the fast changing and social and technological conditions of the 20th century. 
Now, I suppose the impetus for this project could be said to be a photograph taken in 1983 of staff in the British Llanotype Letter Drawing Studio. The photograph was republished in 2012 and it set in train some discussions on social media fora because the staff shown comprised a team of women. This was an all-female team of letter drawers and researchers who worked together in the Department of Typographic Development in the 1980s for some 10 years, creating and producing mainly text typefaces for newspaper composition. Here is just a brief glimpse of the photograph because apart from any embarrassment on my side, I feel that this image of the impression of the department's stamp in which its name is inconspicuous and barely visible, perhaps more accurately reflects the position of its staff, whose work has reached millions of readers, but who have remained largely invisible and hardly recognized until recently. And this position is underlined by these comments from former Lana type employees within and outside the department regarding the creative work being undertaken in a small wing on the top floor of the British Lana type headquarters, work which even within the company was seldom acknowledged. Now, as you can see, these are extracts from interviews undertaken by Ali Savoy, and it was in 2016 that John Hudson, who is here tonight, <laughs> suggested it would be interesting to interview those shown in the 1983 photo as perhaps part of a research project, and we instantly thought of Alice as being the ideal person to undertake this. Alice's experience as a type designer, her PhD research and knowledge of the history of monotype where she worked for several years, has given Alice insights into the crucial role of trike drawing offices in the making of typefaces. And her interests converge with my own and with my experiences, both as a practitioner and a researcher. And we recognize that the presence of women in drawing offices has a long history, yet their contribution has rarely been acknowledged most of these, women, of these people, these women, were forgotten and never credited for their work. So we felt the lack of information on women's precise engagement with type design and manufacture, despite the relevance of their work to current typographic practices, needed to be addressed by establishing, establishing an accurate account of women's roles and contributions to type design. So we began with a university funded pilot study in 2016. And this helped us establish the, the scope of the project and its feasibility. Focusing on the monotype corporation, the pilot study confirmed the availability of relevant archives, and we were able to interview key personnel as are shown here. And the study confirmed the appropriateness of our planned research methods, that is to derive data from interviews, historical records, material history, and previously recorded oral histories. And our initial investigations and interviews already provided valuable previously undocumented information, which helped strengthen our proposal to the Leverhulme Trust for funding for a three year part time interdisciplinary research project. So with the team augmented by another type historian and graphic designer, Dr. Helena Lecker, the project began in March 2018. Well, for us, it was important to have an appropriately scaled project to allow us to invest, investigate the available archives in sufficient depth. So we confined our investigations to the UK in order to provide the first socio-historical account of women's roles and responsibilities My in studios. It works. From 1910 to 1990. Yeah as experienced within the two leading type manufacturing companies in Britain, the Monotype Corporation and Lana Type Committee. I think Cheng's mic is on, by the way. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> that's all right. So this um, shows what the project's title is, and I've managed to sneak in my favorite slide in the next one. Okay, so I was talking about Lana Type Limited, also known as Lana Type and Machinery Limited, and you can see the um, factory in the background here from 1923. And it's also known as Linotype Core Limited. Well, the time frame begins in 1910, the year in which the monotype drawing office was formally established. 
and the pilot study confirmed that it was staffed principally by women. 1990 seems a useful concluding point since the Monotype Corporation was about to go into receivership and Linotype was starting to close its British operations. So you can imagine we've, we've been intent on covering a period of great social upheaval, great transformations in type making from metal to film to digital type, and consequently the introduction of many new practices for women working in the type industry. Well, this project follows in the footsteps of other design historians and critics who have advocated more research of this kind over the last 30 years. For instance, Martha, whom we're delighted to have with us here, she has stressed the need to pay attention to those she calls the not so famous, the non-named designers, their conditions, their experience, etc. So to be clear, our project is concerned with women in industry and for whom the designation type designer is for the most part a, mis a misnomer. Our interest is in the lived experiences of women working in the drawing offices. And we have been seeking to produce a reliable account rather than a romanticized view of their contribution. So our focus is indeed on the not so famous as Martha puts it. So in doing so, we have been identifying and documenting agencies of change for working women in these companies with reference to three interrelated contexts that we have been exploring diachronically. So in terms of social history, in relation to technological developments, and in terms of contribution to typeface design. That is not to say that some didn't become type designers as Alice will explain. Now, some aspects of our project have been challenging and even sad to relate, such as the unexpected demise of key informants. However, we are pleased to have uncovered a great deal of new material in pursuit of realizing our research objective as summarized here. So let me read this for a second. Now, Alice will guide you through some of our research outputs, which are diverse in medium in order to reach different interested audiences around the world. Many thanks. Stop sharing. Have I stopped sharing? Yes, it's all good, thank you, yes. Thank you very much, Fiona. Um, Becky, would you mind? Yeah, great, brilliant. So I will also just take, take a minute to share my screen. Is it all good? Can you see my slides? Yes, all perfect. Good. Uh, and I just need to make this. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, thank you, Fiona. As, as, yeah, we have been uh, researching the contribution of type drawing offices for uh, three and a half years now. Um, I think trying to summarize our findings within the next few minutes would uh, simply be impossible a task. So um, I'll first give you a fi some figures summarizing our research journey, so to say, and then I'll point you to a number of places where you can uh, find out more precisely about our, our, um, yeah, our research findings. Um, oh. Yes, so over the course of the research, we were able to uh, interview or have email exchanges with uh, 18 former monotype and linotype employees, only half of whom uh, were women. Um, the research took us to uh, 12 different archives, the great majority of which were in the UK. As Fiona said, we focused on, on the British monotype and linotype uh, companies. Um, our research uh, journey was uh, hit by one global pandemic, uh, which is still ongoing and which has obviously uh, greatly impacted our plan and our ability to visit a number of archives and, and also to find more people to interview. But uh, despite the hurdles, we were able to make some exciting progress. Uh, so we presented our research on 15 occasions and we have written up three articles and are currently writing up a fourth one. Um, and we have published online. We have a research blog as well as a project website, which uh, we will introduce in a minute. 
So um, our first article was uh, published last year in Journal of Design History uh, by Oxford University Press. Um, it's entitled, entitled The Women Behind Times New Roman, and uh, it relates to the activity of the monotype drawing office, uh, especially in the late 1920s and 1930s. Uh, so that was an intense period of activity for monotype and a period when uh, many of its most famous and long-lasting typefaces were produced, including Times. Um, so uh, the article discusses the role that was played by the women who worked in the type drawing office in uh, really transforming the original artwork that was supplied to them by Stanley Morrison and, and Victor Lardent uh, into uh, factory ready drawings, such as this one. Uh, these were known as 10 inch drawings. Um, and the process in, uh, you know, in making these drawings really involved a great deal of interpretation and iteration, which uh, is something we go into more details into in, in the article. Uh, I think uh, Becky has posted the, the link uh, in the chat. And um, something we don't always realize is that the, the process also required that the women who worked in the, in the drawing offices uh, often uh, had to extend a small set of letter forms that were supplied to them into um, not only an extensive glyph set, but also they had to adapt uh, typeface to a range of optical sizes. Uh, and later they also had to adapt them to a range of, of different styles as was the case for times which exist in, in a lot of different styles and, and variants. Um, and our article also discusses the, the profile um, and the working condition of these women, uh, many of whom were very young, as you can see on this picture, these are the women from both the type drawing office and the matrix factory. Um, and unfortunately, I can't really go into all the details right now, but I would really refer you to the actual, uh, the full text if you, if you want to know more. Um, and in direct connection to, to this topic, Fiona and I are also very excited to have contributed a chapter to the Baseline Shift book uh, edited by, by Briar. Uh, our text in the book highlights more specifically the career of some of the women who worked in the monotype TDO. So um, in particular, I go back to, the, to that picture and uh, women like Dora Pritchett, who is here, uh, and Dora Lang, who is here, and um, both of whom uh, spent most of their working lives at Monotype and became uh, central figures of the type drawing office and really valued members of staff. And we also discussed the working life of Patricia Saunders, who um, joined Monotype as a drawing clerk in the 1950s, uh, and who then went on to originate new designs and uh, who was eventually credited as a, uh, as a monotype designer on typefaces such as Ariel or Columbus. And we were very lucky to interview um, uh, Patricia as part of our research. And sadly, she passed away a couple of years ago. Um, on more of the linotype side now, uh, Fiona has written up an incredibly uh, thorough and fascinating peer-reviewed case study on the development of linotype devonagari uh, to be published imminently in the Journal of uh, the Printing Historical Society. I think it's, it, it either has been printed or in the process of being printed. Um, and uh, Fiona's article highlights the importance of uh, crediting invisible hands across time. So not only those of women, but also the work done by overseas colleagues and software and research and development pioneers as well. Um, so Fiona's uh, substantial studies is more particularly concerned with linotype devnagari in its digital form. And she um, discusses, of course, the, the contribution of the women uh, who are pictured in this photograph. So including the, the change of culture that emerged in the, in the drawing office in the 1980s uh, under her management. And I think the article really makes clear that a strong research component uh, formed part of the team's design process. And uh, it highlights the contribution of some of the key actors, such as Georgina Sermon, whom we interviewed for, for this research and for the article. Um, I also think that uh, Fiona's case study for line type devonagari is a, a quite a fascinating journey in the successive technological changes that um, impacted type production throughout the 20th century from metal to digital with obviously a particular focus here on early digital type. 
Um, we are also currently preparing a text to be published as part of a book called The Edinburgh, it's the Edinburgh Companion to Women in Publishing, uh, edited by Nicola Wilson and, and her colleagues. Uh, the book is to be published by Edinburgh University Press. So our contribution there consists in more of a general overview of, of the research coupled with a couple of case studies that uh, retrace our findings. Um, Fiona showed this, so I just mentioned quickly that we have a research blog where we sporadically post about our research and about various events. Um, the blog was initially a way for us to have an online presence throughout the, our research process. But uh, as we progressed uh, and as we collected uh, quite a lot of captivating material and uh, more specifically photographs, um, it felt increasingly necessary for us to find a more visual and interactive way to share um, all of this research material. And I think the need felt even more pressing uh, as COVID hit and prevented us from holding a couple of exhibitions that we had started to plan. So that's when we really felt the urge to conceive a different platform that would come as a sort of complement to our talks and publication and that could act as some kind of uh, visual online display of our findings. Um, so Fiona and I gathered our thoughts and ideas and we were very lucky to find in Mathieu Trier, the perfect partner in crime to do this. Um, together we devised a new website, a platform that's hopefully, that feels less academic and, and maybe more accessible uh, to navigate through our research findings uh, in what we hope to be an intuitive and very visual way. So Fiona and I put together the content uh, with, uh, and with Helena, of course, with Helena Lecker. Um, Mathieu took care of the, of the design and the code. Um, um, I should say that uh, Fiona mentioned it at the, at the very beginning, in terms of content, it's still work in progress. We plan, we are adding more content uh, uh, as, uh, you know, as we go along. Um, and yeah, the website presents a, a curated selection of the findings and, and archival material we gathered during the course of our research. Uh, so hopefully the navigation should feel um, fairly self-explanatory. Um, and, and yeah, we hope to provide visitors with a kind of rounded view of, of our findings with this. And I'll now let Mathieu tell you a bit more about the, about the website itself. Lovely, thanks so much. Uh, all right, right now you should see my default desktop background, beautiful. And uh, now you should see my presentation. Um, so, uh, good evening. My name is Mathieu. I'm a software engineer and designer. I work at the BBC uh, during the day, but I also edit and design a magazine called Visions, um, well, at night, I guess, and also make typefaces and websites. So that's why I feel quite lucky that Alice and Fiona got in touch with me to work on this one at womenintype.com. I had seen Alice's Beatrice Ward lecture a couple of years ago at Simbright. Uh, and she talked about the project, and I remember taking notes and pictures, thinking there was such a wealth of amazing stories and, and images there. So now getting to work with that and trying to show it in its best light, making it as attractive, as interesting as possible, felt like a real privilege. And the first thing that I wanted to do with the website was to try to establish some sort of visual identity, a general mood, um, general feel that would permeate through the website. And somehow that felt a little bit challenging because the website was so image heavy and there was such a wealth of images uh, that finding the perfect typefaces to really support it um, felt quite daunting. My first uh, kind of idea, and this is a, a, one of the sketches that I had showed uh, Alice and Fiona early on, was to go to Times New Roman. As Alice uh, explained, these women were really involved in the making of Time, Times New Roman. And so presenting in this slide felt kind of like reappropriating it and I kind of like that idea but if we were going to make something new and fresh and you know different it, it, it felt like a missed opportunity not to use something designed by a living woman so when I started looking for something different I uh, found this typeface um, gig designed by Francisca Weidgruber and it felt immediately right the project is a lot about the about drawing about the human hand and it felt appropriate to have something that felt hand-drawn. And it has that energetic hand, the, the felt-tip marker vibe, and it kind of really works with the idea of the archive and people working in an office day-to-day. -day. 
And so this is what the opening of the website looks like. It's uncovering women in type. And you can see there's quite a bit more color than the previous option. Uh, a lot of the imagery that comes from the archives, of course, in black and white, and that can maybe lend a bit of a dry tone to the content. So by using a simple duo tone, we can inject a little bit of life in the pictures. But of course, it's not gratuitous. The colors are used to color code the different themes of the articles on the website, but organizing the, the articles and the themes and presenting it so people can browse it um, was a little bit of a process. Um, the initial idea was we wanted to offer a variety of articles that someone could um, choose from and get an idea of with images. That, that was sort of the brief. But at the same time, presenting all these images with a title felt quite messy and very kind of overwhelming. And it missed that discovery feeling that we wanted to give to the experience, the idea that maybe you're looking through a box in an archive and suddenly you're pulling something out that's really interesting. But it had to walk the line between exposing the content and inviting people to discover it because we didn't want people to have to go click around and to constantly discover things. And this is an example of something we didn't go with well, you can imagine sort of all these things scattered about and you have to kind of pull them in to see what they are, um, which might be a bit time consuming. So this is what we came up with. This is the actual website. And the, the solution was kind of obvious as soon as we hid the type away. The collage of images on their own with their own colors and the mix of black and white and color created great texture. And it was on its own inviting and, and kind of invite, invited curiosity to try and see what was behind. And showing the type on hover invited people to do just that, to work out, oh, that's just it. And showing the color also allowed us to link it to the different themes. The difficulty, of course, with hover is that it does not work on mobile. There's no hover. Uh, so we had to resort to using, um, to using scroll. And when the element is in the middle of the page, it kind of opens up, uses the color and the title so you can see what's going on. So, so you can still browse, but you still get that idea that maybe you're discovering it. Uh, a big part of the website also is its reading list. Uh, on the website, you'll find a majority uh, of the very great references that the team used during their research. And much like the rest of the website, we're trying to lead with images. So we've got all these covers, these papers that you can kind of just look at. But when you hover, you get these little labels that kind of pop up, give you the exact reference that you can use uh, if you want to. And that keeps that's kind of in keeping with this library feel, maybe slightly more museum feel, where you kind of have this little label that describes what you're looking at. Uh, when we got to the articles, um, the text face became uh, more of a problem that I had to, what well, we had to deal with, and um, it, we needed something that was going to work with gig, something that could be used for extended text, but somehow retain the same kind of vitality. And with gig being so fresh and contemporary, it felt like we might need something that felt more classic to balance it out. And Alice suggested a few typefaces to try, but Grotesque 6 by Emily Rigo uh, struck me immediately. It, it follows the Stevenson Blake model uh, of the grotesque, which I really love. And it has that wonkiness that creates just a really nice texture, but still it's, even, it's kind of even and readable, um, re really nice. And Emily managed to bring just the right amount of modernity um, by using these uneven shapes, but that, that makes it work um, really well with Gig. But Grotesque 6 had one issue, it had no italics. And I tried a bunch of other typefaces, but really I think I was just a little bit in love with it and nothing really quite worked as well. So instead we reached out to Francisca to see if we could get a viable font of Gig. And thanks to that, we could dial in just the right weight, just the right X height uh, to, work, to make it work alongside Grotesque 6. And it turns out it works great as an italic companion. Look at that. Using uh, a different typeface for regular italic was always on my typographic bucket list. So I'm, I'm pleased that this one worked out. And this is what the article page actually looks like. Um, you can see there are a stack of images alongside the text. And as you scroll, it feels like looking through that box of photographs that kind of fall from the page and you can look through them. And that was kind of an important feeling, but also trying to make it not too dis not distracting whilst you're actually reading. So the, the pace of it uh, had to be managed because also some of the articles contain audio and video extract that, can, that had to be played directly. And so you'll have to find these, so go explore. And that's the call font. That's the end of the website. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Matthew. And I'm just now going to um, pin spotlight all our speakers. So bear with me for just a second while I find everyone. Um, sorry about this. Um, so I've done Briar. Okay. So I've just got to scroll down the whole list of um, attendees. There's so many lovely people here. Um, right. Uh, there we go. We're getting there. Thank you for Matthew and Fiona. Sorry about this. Okay. Um, oh. I don't know if I can spotlight any more people actually. Um, so let me um, just spotlight Fiona for now while we go for questions with the um, women in tight and then we'll just have to ask um, the other speakers to just speak up and they should still appear. So sorry about this. Um, oh. Ah, Fiona, I think you need to start your video and then I can spotlight you. I think that might be the problem. So, oh yeah, here we go. That might have been the issue. Sorry about this. Right, I'll just go back and spotlight everyone else. Sorry about this. There we go. Right, okay. Um, we need Martha. Um, so, and Ratna, Brian, we've got, okay. Sorry about this. Thank you everyone for bearing with us while I just um, go through the list. We've got so many people here. It's great. Um, just hard to find all our speakers. So have I got everyone? Yes, we have. Brilliant. So sorry about that. Thank you for bearing with me. Thank you, Becky. Um, so um, there was just a lovely comment from Claire just saying this is so amazing. Beautiful work and, work and fascinating research. Felt it deserved being read out to you all. Um, as a question from Claire who says, as a Reading MA student, I'm beginning research into dissertation ideas, one in particular, the introduction of the female critical voice in graphic design. I'm curious about any thoughts from the panel on this topic and any notable findings within your research that highlighted not just the female designers talent, but also, also their critical voice within their field. Quite a big question. Um, does anyone want to start us off? Um, I can throw out the um, name of Sheila de Bretville, an American designer and an early uh, feminist writer within graphic design. Um, mm -hmm. I think she was published in something called Heresies very early on and some other places. Um, and I would say, I mean, I think for us, and I'm not saying this because Martha is here, but, uh, you know, Martha's article, Messy History versus Neat History, I think has been very influ influential for many of us. And I think for me, there was also um, this article by uh, Cheryl Buckley mm. about uh, uh, that was published in Design Issue, which I think is called Made in Patriarchy. And uh, she talks about design being a collaborative process. And that was also um, uh, yeah, a, a found foundational um, uh, reading for me uh, in, in this research process. Um, there was also, I, I think it was a Sun Bride event uh, put together by um, Sarah de Bont, who I think is here tonight, and um, Catherine de Smet um, about the history of graphic design. And there is this great big black book that was published as part of it, yes. History in the writing. Thank you, Briar. Um, <laughs> I think this is a, a really good one to have in your in your on your bookshelf as well. Great. Does anyone else want to add to that before we move on to the next question? I think. Okay. So let's move on. Um, so a question for Fiona and Alice from John Hudson. Um, will the raw interview transcripts or recordings be deposited in an accessible archive? Reading question mark for future research. Yes, um, this, this, this will be the case. We've already deposited the, the interviews um, in safekeeping with the uh, special collections. Uh, I think Emma Mins, who's, um, uh, who uh, sees to this, is working out how, how they will be made accessible for researchers. Um, obviously, we had to get all the permissions and they've all been got from, from our interviewees. And um, we've also um, used a transcription service, a very good one. And so we have transcripts as well 
of these so that they can be cited. Um, we haven't quite yet worked out how, as I say, how it's going to be accessible to researchers. I, I will say that because of um, the pandemic, we, as Ali said, we couldn't interview everyone in person. And of course, it was wonderful to be able to interview people in person because you could actually look at things together, as Martha has said about when she interviewed people, it makes a big difference. Uh, one of the people we did interview who was really instrumental in some of the innovative features that really was software that supported the work in the in the type drawing office because we dealt with South Asian and Arabic scripts was was uh, Mike Fellows and his <laughs> believe it or not um, in Gloucestershire the uh, internet's not really very good and the even the signal for the mobile phone is pretty hopeless in some places so in the end he gave us follow-up recordings didn't he Alice we we sent yes, yes. questions to him and he gave follow-up recordings and those have been taped so there's a little bit of a mixture but yes they will be accessible John that's great thank you and um there's a question that we had earlier on from Catherine Dixon which I think um applies to everyone in the room so please feel free to um answer as and when you wish to so um she said she's increasingly interested in not only women being represented in graphic design history but also the issue of age Curious about the thoughts of the panel on the representation of older women in graphic design. I think I could say a little bit about that, but I think that when I was uh, looking at, at um, Little Press in my uh, PhD at, at Reading, I think that people were very surprised. Um, all, all the women were very surprised to be approached um that their view was you know or their experience um um was was valuable or, or interesting so it sort of was quite a forgotten contribution um and you had to really dig to to, to find those those voices um so i think yeah i think catherine was right i think that age was was a was a real criteria and i think the the, the saddest part of it was that when you got to them um, and you had a conversation with them, you, they revealed this rich experience um, of quite radical work that they had done in quite difficult times. Um, but they were sort of judged for how they looked physically as the older people. Um, and they were sort of dismissed, I, I, I would say. So I think that there's a subtle point in, in what Catherine's bringing to our attention. I don't know if anybody else has a, has a reflection on that. Well, one thing I would like to add is, um, following on from what you're saying, Ratner, is that we had, why we didn't have as many women as we'd hoped so far um, responding is because quite a number of them just didn't feel that they had anything to contribute. They didn't see the value of their work at all. And um, I mean, I was quite hesitant to be interviewed myself. Alice had, it took a long time for me to agree to it. Um, I was very keen on making sure that, you know, my team had been recognized, credited, and, you know, it's, it's much easier to do it for someone else. But, um, yes, it, it was, that was a real shame. That was a real shame that they didn't see that, even though their work reached millions, you know. Did anyone else have any thoughts before we move on to the next question? Yeah, and I don't know if it's a question of, like, women working into their older years, or if we're talking about women being interviewed when they are older. I mean, I found in interviewing women typesetters for graphic means, American women, they were happy to talk and they were happy to tell me all the ways that, that they were disrespected. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, some of the stories didn't even make it into the film, but um, so there could be also cultural things, but I also, there's also definitely, um, also definitely like um so so uh, yeah like the I wasn't sure if the question was about you know the uh folks being interviewed um who had worked or if we're talking about women and their contributions like as they work into um you know their older years which you know I see as being maybe is being taken more seriously I don't know I and if, if that's what you were talking about Catherine I don't know 
think that's um, so much to think about. Um, yeah. Did anyone else have anything, anything else to add before we move on? Shall I um, go to the next question? Okay. The next question is for Matthew. Um, I'm sorry, Niamh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, so huge apologies if I am. Um, so they said, hello, I'm designing an archive for women in type. What are the three main assets for a successful archive or website? And how would you alter type throughout to suit the tone? Well, um, I don't know if I have three assets to give you, but I can maybe give you one, um, which is, I think you need to consider the amount of things you want to display because displaying 30 things or a thousand things is, is different. And also whether you want to lead people through in a specific way, or if you want to let them explore. If you want to let them explore, you want to really have things tagged in many different ways so people can kind of dig and arrive at it from different angles. And if you want to lead them, then you need to prepare that journey. I think for the website, we were more on the trying to lead people in slightly, but also we were working with less content. So there wasn't a high need to filter things. We still had categories, but you could imagine things being filtered by decades. And I think this is where the type comes in maybe. And I quite like being quite extravagant with my type, but I think I had to restrain myself a little bit here um, because we were covering multiple decades. And I think maybe it's not quite as apparent as maybe we would have liked, but um, if you're covering multiple decades, it's a fantastic opportunity to use different typefaces that represent these decades. And if you were in miraculously in possession of, of a typeface that could you know, um, change like that, I have a sort of viable axis that could emphasize different characteristics, which might represent these decades, then you, know, you could maybe have a, that's kind of ever changing um, ambient feel to the website as you're going through the archive. The same way, you know, the paper stock changes, the quality changes, the, you go from typewritten things to printed things. Um, that kind of feeling could be, you know, added into the journey, but you also need to consider what you want people to get out of it. Is it a story or is it finding and using it as a, as a research resource? Absolutely, great, thank you so much. And I think we've got time for just one more question before we wrap up. Oh, sorry, Fiona, did you want to say something? I want to add one thing, which actually yeah. Mariah might be able to answer this, but the other crucial thing is copyright permissions for images you use. Yeah, and you're that's building, a big one. <laughs> building the most amazing archive, Mariah. Yeah, that's a whole can of worms, but I do, and I do recommend checking out the People's Graphic Design Archive. And the, the type question is a big one, but I think Matthew, hit on the big the one of the most important things which is tagging so that people can find what they're looking for great thank you all so much and the last question i think we have time for this evening is from sarah de bont who asks when do the speakers choose to produce a website and when a book and how does the choice affect how they curate their material which is a great question i think I can maybe just say, uh, Fiona, you tell me if I'm wrong, but when, you know, for the Women in Type project specifically, we, we had decided from the beginning not to make a book, but to make articles because we felt there was maybe a bit more flexibility in the way, you know, we didn't know how much material we we're going to find. And it feels that you, we, we can have kind of detailed case studies um, that can be published in different places. The, the, as I said, I think in, in our, presentation I think the, the feel the need for the website really came from um, wanting to have a less academic way of showing our findings and it felt sometimes a bit frustrating in articles to have only you know three four five images associated to the text where we felt there was so much that was coming out from the images and I think that's really when the idea for the website became uh, important to us and I said COVID of course uh, was an important factor to that but uh, yeah being able to show so many images was uh, felt really appropriate to the web. I think that's a, that's a great addition and Fiona because I remember just um, you know, being a student in India, not being able to access so much and having, you know, some of it as, as just a resource or reference for you to kind of be able to, to dig further um, is, a, is a great way of getting young people interested in it and for opening up the research and encouraging future research. I think that was, the, that was a great discussion. There, there's a question which Alice, perhaps you'd answer about Antilla. 
who we, we uh, perhaps you could yes yes I, I saw someone was asking about um, yeah we we did interview her uh, as part of the research uh, sadly she's passed away and uh, she was part of our pilot study uh, back in 2016 and she was really helpful and uh, so Anne Pilar was um uh, she was a professor at the University of, of Reading. She was teaching in Reading. And, but before that, she worked for Monotype as a publicity manager there. Um, and so uh, we were able to interview her and get her to tell us about her experience. She was one of the very few female managers at Monotype at the time. And, um, and uh, it was a very um, fascinating um, interview, which, of course, the, the archive of which is, is held at Reading now. And, and uh, we will write up about her on the website. Um, and yes, yeah, she was a, she was just wonderful. Yeah, Catherine says she was one of the best of people. And actually, you will see at the end of the of the talks we have a slide saying it's yeah. the, you know in memoriam. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would I think it's time to wrap up. Sadly, I feel like we could chat all night. It's been an absolutely fantastic evening. So I just want to say a huge thank you in particular to Fiona and Alice for coordinating this evening. They've done an absolutely incredible job and putting everything together and a huge thank you to everyone for doing such fantastic talks and I can't wait to go back and re-watch them already I'm I, you know it's been absolutely brilliant and just like to thank you all for giving your time so generously as well um it's been absolutely brilliant so if we could have a, a virtual round of applause that would be absolutely fantastic but before we all go I know Fiona and Alice would just like to say a few more words so um if you just bear with me again for two seconds. Um, uh, sorry. Um, okay. Sorry about this. Nearly there. Um, share screen. So I think over to you, Alice and Fiona. Well, we, we would like to say final thanks to all our speakers and attendees, amazing turnout. And of course, to the University of Reading and the Levy Hume Trust for making our project possible. And of course, many thanks to St. Bride's for hosting this evening and in particular to Becky. Alice might want to say a few words and then we'll have the last slide. So thanks to everybody. Yeah. I'll just say thanks very much to everyone and thank you, Becky. You've done an amazing job at you know making this feel so smooth and easy for us. So and yes, and thank you for our amazing speakers as well. If you could just put up the last slide, that would be yeah. Many thanks. Thanks everyone.